Hello, and welcome to video number two of our romp through the history of paleontology. So in this video, um, we're going to be um, looking at how humans have tried to explain fossils, both without and within a scientific framework. So as opposed to the last video, when we were looking at folklore, um, in this video, we're going to kind of chart um, some of the explanations that humans use to explain the presence of fossils in rock um, in a way which um, gradually takes us towards um, the kind of methodological naturalism, the use of evidence to explain these structures that we use in science today. So, so let's move on and let's start by talking about classical antiquity. So on the left hand side here you can see Xenophanes of Colophon. This was a Greek philosopher and poet and he realised that fossil shells suggested that the rocks that host those shells had originated in the sea. He suggested that the world had formed from the condensation of water, he described it as a primordial mud, and he's the first person to use fossil evidence um, in a theory of the history of the Earth, so that justifies his inclusion in this lecture. In the middle, you can see Herodotus. This is a famous Greek historian. And he could have been describing, we're not sure, but he may well have been describing fossilized mammal bones when he spoke of remains in the Mokotan Mountains of Arabia, so modern day Egypt, that he thought may have belonged to winged serpents. So he didn't try and explain these beyond our more folklore based explanations, but he did mention things in his writings that may have been fossils. On the right hand side here you can see Aristotle hanging out with his chum Plato who taught him everything he knew or not as the case may be. So Aristotle had a theory involving um, the origin of fossils which suggested that fossil objects grew in rocks in situ as a response to the actions of an organic essence or seed. Not the idea that we believe is necessarily true today, but nevertheless, you can't blame him for coming up with that as an idea, because based on what he knew at the time, it was a perfectly sensible thing to say. So that's what people thought in classical antiquity. If we move on to, to into the what we may want to consider the Middle Ages, just as a way of, of naming that particular period, as early as the 6th century, the Chinese scholar Li Taoyuan described a site um, he called stone fish. This was a, a, um, a site which he documented that described fossil fish in minute detail in his writings. And in those writings, he accepted these as true fish, so they were the remains of fish, but he offered no thoughts as how they came to be where, they, where he found them. So there was no kind of um, uh, explanation of the process or the mechanism by which these fish were found in, in a rock. The next person um, that I came across in my reading at least to really think about the origins of fossils was a Persian polymath who in his anglicized name we called Avicenna. He in the Book of Healing, which was um, uh, dates back to 1027, suggested that fossils may result from the action of petrifying fluids. So these are fluids that may move through a rock and um, replace structures that were already there with fluids. And this was picked up by some, but as we will see, not all, figures in Europe. So this gentleman on the right hand side here is known as Albertus Magnus. He was a Dominican friar, so a, a Christian religious man, who followed this teaching and he wrote that in places where a petrifying force is exhaling, the bodies of such animals are changed into the dominant element, namely earth mixed with water, and then the mineralizing power converts this mixture into stone. He said that this means that parts of the body of organisms that, was, that are found in a rock retain their shape inside and outside just as they were before. So this is a really interesting um, kind of uh, a pattern of, of a few people that have suggested that actually, and relatively early on in our historical narrative, that fossils are the remains of once living organisms. So that's pretty cool, I think. During uh, or just after this time period, um, or I suppose just after, depends what you mean by just, but we have this period in um, the history of Northern Europe that we call the Renaissance. So this was a movement for the, from the 14th to the 17th centuries that was centred around Italy. 
but which ultimately spread across Europe that included the rediscovery of classical Greek philosophy and a resurgence of learning based on classical sources. An example of one of the scholars of the Renaissance was Leonardo da Vinci, da Vinci sorry, who lived from 1452 to 1519 and is shown in this self-portrait on the left-hand side here, in the middle and the right, are some of his sketches. He was big on anatomy and these are some sketches of some rocks because he also thought about rocks as well. Um, it's one of his field sketches, in fact. And in his um, writing and his thoughts about rocks, we know that he, he saw, he discovered shells on mountaintops and fish bones in caves. And he posited, he thought, that these must be the remains of animals from when those places were covered in the sea. His writings make it clear that he thought a biblical flood so a flood, as featured in the Christian Bible, was an inadequate explanation for the structures that he was seeing. And he suggest, suggested, as a result, that the surface of the earth must have changed over time. And where there is now land, there must have once been sea. So that's quite a, 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 G, a, sorry, a leap of logic is the phrase that I'm looking for there. Um, so he actually said that, OK, we've got land now, but once that was sea. He also suggested that the movement of water in rivers is a strong natural force, and um, that's a force, he said, that sculpts the very features of our landscapes. And he built this picture in his writings of slow and relentless natural processes, which we may really identify with today as we're learning about geology, as opposed to divine instantaneous acts that were described in, say, Genesis in the Christian Bible. Um, and so some of these explanations really um, echo, mirror, and indeed are the origins of some of the, the thoughts that we have today about the way that geology and, uh, works and the way that fossils are preserved. So that's particularly of note. The explanations that I gave you in the last video, those on folklore, those are by, almost by definition, they're very local. People... Um, and folklore is very concentrated into particular regions. In, in broader regions, you tend to have an educated minority. And in this early modern period that we're on to now, so we're talking the 17th, the 18th centuries, um, so after the Renaissance, we've moved forward a bit in time, this educated minority in Europe at this time saw fossils as anti-diluvian relics. So that means they are relics of the biblical floods. Um, so these are um, animals in origin, people suggested, but they had been transported and then buried by the flood that we know um, from the Bible. And an example of this is the Swiss scholar Johann Schweitzer. Um, he was a fellow of the Royal Society in the UK, and he is um, known for describing a fossil giant salamander that now bears his name. It's called Andreas Schuchserai. Um, and he described this as a fossil. Um, you can see this um, initial um, illustration of this on the right-hand side here, as a fossil called Homo diluvii testis. This is the Latin for man, a witness of the deluge. And he suggested that this fossil was in fact a man, that a human being that had drowned in the biblical flood. And that was kind of uh, very representative of the educated minority from the Renaissance uh, until the Enlightenment period, and as we'll meet in the next video, about what people thought about the origin of fossils. The other person that I've mentioned here is Conrad Gessner. And um, this, I have just highlighted, um, I have highlighted this person just because he was the first publisher, the first person to publish a book that is known to illustrate fossils. So that is also a note in this area. If we move forward a tiny bit in time, we can look quickly into Nicholas Steno. This is a Danish scientist who was around in the middle of the 1600s. He was a pioneer in both anatomy and also in geology. He became a pa Catholic bishop in his later years, despite being born a, a Lutheran, so he moved from uh, being a Protestant Christian to a Catholic Christian, which was, I suspect, a relatively unusual shift in the time period he was living at, in. Um, 
And what's interesting is, um, as alongside this religious background, he believed that uh, we should interpret natural phenomena um, via evidence and not necessarily using the biblical texts that he was um, used to and, and educated in um, based on his religious upbringing. You can see a, a, a illustration of the man on the left here. And in the middle, um, you can see some very famous laws that he, um, he came up with, um, which are related to stratigraphy, the study of um, uh, layers of rock. So those were quite important in the founding of geology, but he also made moves in what we now consider to be paleontology. An example of this is that in October 1666, two fishermen caught a huge shark near Livorno in Italy, where Stino had settled in 1666. They captured this shark and they sent the head of the shark to Stino, who dissected it and published his findings in 1667. And the, the illustrations from that publication are shown on the right here. He noted that those teeth from this shark resembled stony objects called glossopterae or tongue stones, which have been, had been found in rocks before this time, but had previously been believed to have fallen from the sky or naturally grown in rocks. He's actually argued in contrast to that view that those were shark teeth and they were from the mouths of once living but now dead sharks and that they had come to be buried in mud or sand in a, um, a, a sediment, a, a kind of a, a pre-rock as it were, that has now become dry land. And he suggested that the difference in composition between the teeth of a living shark and these objects that he found in rocks were due to alteration in chemical composition without a changing in the form of these structures. So that's actually very perspicacious, it's very insightful. And um, again, it, it reflects many of the ideas that we have about fossils today. So Nicholas Stino was a very important gentleman that plays a key role in our story. The other person that I've mentioned on this side is Robert Plant. He was a keeper of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and he is notable for um, making the first known illustration of dinosaur bone. He attributed it, attributed it to a giant human, uh, whereas actually we now believe today it was a re representative of the dinosaur Megalosaurus. Um, so he didn't necessarily recognize the zoological animal origin of that structure, but nevertheless, he did um, illustrate what we now know to be a dinosaur bone, so that was quite important. And at the same time as these development were, developments were happening, there were also um, religious um, advances in, in the way um, that the organized church, so this is the Christian church, because we're talking primarily Northern Europe here, tackled geological questions. An example of this is the gentleman that's shown on the left-hand side here. This is James Usher. He lived from 1581 to 1656, and he was an Irish archbishop um, based in Armagh. He was a uh, very religious man, and in 1650, he published a, um, a, a book called the Annales Fitteris Testamenti, a prima munda origine deducti. Apologies for my pronunciation there, because my Latin is incredibly poor, I'm sure. But this was, um, this transliterates to Annals of the Old Testament deduced from the first origins of the world. And he based his study on the Bible, on the chronology of Old Testament um, characters and his knowledge of ancient history. And by placing all of those together, ancient history and then biblical characters, he calculated in this book that the date of creation, as represented in the Christian um, book of Genesis, and represented by this image on the right here, Adam and Eve and the snake, um, he suggested that the, the date of creation would have been nightfall on the 22nd of October, 4004 BC. So quite precise, but not necessarily matching what we believe about the antiquity of the Earth today. And that brings us to the origin of our video number two. And we're going to get on to more things about the origin um, of paleontology as a science as we know it today in video number three shortly. I will see you there.